All right, perfect. Uh, so I was just saying that we're going to try to imagine the worst case scenario where resources of expertise uh, is limited and to give practitioners information to make them more uh, to make more independent clinical decisions with assistance when needed. This is not within our normal standards of practice, but during a disaster, um, we must be flexible and be able to adapt. Um, uh, I should clarify that any notations for cutoffs to ask for assistance are noted, but not, are definitely not exclusive. Um, All right, so um, so basically what uh, what I'd like to mention before we start this is there is no such thing as an emergency in a pandemic. Yes, patient may have a large vessel occlusion, but it's very, very important to take your time and put your PPE on correctly. You cannot run into a, uh, to save a life. You, you might save one life or you might not, but you might also end up being sick and not being able to care for any of your other patients. Or you may become the patient yourself. So do nothing, maybe the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. Uh, but it's important to know that you are a limited resource and you must be protected. So as far as critical care resources and staffing during uh, disasters, like I said, flexibility is key. People use their skill sets to use their, to the best of their ability. Um, this is one example where uh, non-ICU nurses will work under the, uh, the direction of ICU nurses who will work under the direction of CRNAs, uh, nurse practitioners, MDs, and DOs um, for as far as like basic mechanical ventilation is concerned. And then uh, uh, ICU advanced practice pro uh, providers would essentially direct this team under the expertise or of a trained, uh, experienced critical care physician. Um, so consultants can still see every patient. Um, we will need to smooth out communication within the team. Um, as far as uh, beds and ventilators, uh, you can see over here that the United States has actually more uh, beds, more, more critical care beds per 100,000 inhabitants in, like, uh, than many other countries, than Germany, Italy, France, South Korea, uh, uh, United Kingdom, and China. Um, the question is, who needs these ICU beds? Um, basically, to, to summarize this, it's any patient with hypo acute hypoxic respiratory failure requiring invasive mechanical ventilation. Hypotensive patients um, who are either in shock or just requiring uh, some degree of pressors to maintain uh, organ perfusion. Acute renal failure requiring renal replacement therapy. These are the primary cases that require um, uh, critical care beds. Um, transmission, we're not going to talk about this too much because uh, uh, this has been covered in the past as far as like how long the, the, the virus can actually let, stay on a, on a um, on a particular surface. Um, as far as uh, PPEs are concerned, uh, uh, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to, uh, to know how to properly don and duff. Um, watch the videos for donning and duffing. Uh, and, uh, and it's very important to understand that high-risk procedures for aerosolization, such as intubation, bronchoscopy, trachs, uh, giving nebulizers, uh, opening suctions, uh, using uh, uh, high flow nasal cannulas, although like uh, we typically recommend putting a mask on top of that, uh, on top of the high flow nasal cannula. In our shop, we're not actually using BiPAPs at this point. Uh, yes, there's still definitely uh, unknowns. Uh, um, and uh, um, unknowns what to do if N95 masks are not available. Hopefully at this point, most of you guys have N95 masks, uh, masks that are, are currently available. Um, the clinical course incubation period, uh, median five days, uh, can be three days up to 24 days. The onset of symptoms starts typically between day one to day three. Uh, fever usually uh, uh, occurs on day one. And uh, uh, um, with headaches, nausea, vomiting, constitutional symptoms, by day four to nine, patients have shortness of breath. By day 10 to 21, there is resolution of symptoms or progression to critical uh, to, to becoming a critical care uh, critical care patient. By day 21, most patients, unfortunately, have either died or were discharged. Um, 
Uh, systemic manifestations of COVID-19 are C-reactive protein, ferritin, the presence of lymphopenia, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the CPK, AST, ALT, D-dimer, LDH, interleukin-6, and uh, the presence of low albumin and uh, hemoglobin. Um, you can see over here, this is uh, essentially the course. Uh, and you can see for the most part, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but typically by day 14, by like by around day 12, patients become more critically ill. And by, uh, by day 14, this is essentially the time when patients start to crash. They develop acute cardiac injury, acute kidney injury, secondary infection, and death. Uh, this is a patient with a CT scan of, uh, with interstitial pneumonia. Um, uh, uh, this is an ultrasound showing, uh, an ultrasound showing uh, pleural thickening and irregularity, as well as V-lines consistent with interstitial lung edema, um, which you can occasionally see. Um, so as far as pulse oximetry, there, uh, uh, a really interesting article in the New York Times um, uh, where I'm, I'm going to quote this, there is a way we can identify more patients who have COVID pneumonia sooner and treat them more effectively. And it would not require waiting for a coronavirus test at a hospital or a doctor's office. It requires detecting silent hypoxia early through common medical devices such ca that can be purchased without uh, prescriptions, such as a pulse oximeter. That being said, I don't necessarily recommend all patients be watched at home and monitored at home. Um, there are uh, uh, certain features of a uh, uh, theories for a silent hypoxia, impaired lung gas exchange with preserved lung compliance and CO2 clearance, um, alveolar surfactant, surfactant deficiency. Uh, there is a neurotropic effect uh, that blunts the normal brainstem autonomic responses. There's emerging data that supports this. Um, this is primarily supported by the presence of anosmia, the anosmia phenomena. Uh, coronavirus may be, may, might directly interfere with oxygen binding uh, to, to hemoglobin. Uh, met hemoglobin uh, phenomenon. Um, as far as respiratory progression is concerned, optimal therapy for respiratory support for these patients is at this point not necessarily known, but we have been treating viral respiratory failures for years. So we know from experience and our knowledge that for the most part, we start with low flow nasal cannula and gradually progress to high flow nasal cannula. Um, uh, for the most part, we typically apply a face mask when they're available on top of the high flow nasal cannula to minimize aerosolization. Um, avoid very high rates, try to stay less under 15 to 30 liters. May uh, um, face masks and venturi masks, uh, 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 there is a risk of aerosolization, but if a vent is not available, uh, may be discussed as, a, as an option. Invasive mechanical ventilation, tidal volume target between six and eight uh, ml per ideal body weight uh, using lung protective uh, ventilation strategy with some degree of hy permissive hypercapnia. Uh, prone positioning uh, early rather than uh, uh, late. Um, and at very late stages, uh, we have been doing case uh, like uh, VV ECMO. Um, and as patients start to recover, we gradually progress and gradually graduate them from one uh, from proning to like invasive mechanical ventilation. When we extubate them, they're typically on high flow nasal, uh, high flow nasal cannula before they go on a low flow nasal cannula. Uh, so what happens uh, in a typical critical respiratory course is 15 to 20 percent of patients will require will be hospitalized. Five percent will need ICU admissions. Most need nasal cannula to maintain oxygen saturations more than 90. Uh, um, important to recognize signs of a pending respiratory failure, respiratory, uh, persistently increased respiratory rate more than 30, persistent uh, hypoxemia, um, oxygen saturation is less than 90, increased work of breathing using the neck, intercostal muscles, or abdominal muscles to breathe. Um, don't wait till the patient's crashing before you intubate. I would recommend that we, we typically pull the trigger early to intubate. That being said, we are delaying intubation as long as possible. Um, because once they're intubated, uh, they're going to go through the entire course intubated. It's, it's, it's not very easy to de-escalate. Um, for the most part, as far as ventilator settings are concerned, um, uh, we have been implementing mechanical ventilation using very low volume, low tidal volumes, four to eight ml per kilogram predicted body weight. Uh, 
and lower inspiratory pressures with a plateau, uh, plateau pressure under 30. The initial tidal volume is 6 mLs per uh, kilogram body weight, uh, with the tidal volume up to 8 mL per kilogram. Uh, 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 predicted body weight is allowed if undesirable side effects occur, such as dyssynchrony or the patient's acidotic with a pH less than 7.15. Permissive hypercapnia is permitted. That being said, I would caution uh, 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 our listeners that um, for the most part, most of these patients do not have, the vast majority of these patients don't have neurologic injuries. So we will typically allow uh, the PCO2 to rise. Um, I try my best to minimize that as much as possible, especially if they have uh, neurologic injuries, um, because the more hypercapnic they are, the more vasodilation they have. Um, this is definitely an issue we ran into in some of our patients who had uh, uh, who were COVID positives and had intracranial hemorrhage and elevated intracranial pressure. In these cases, uh, we were very cautious not to allow the PCO2 to rise too much because that would cause significant vasodilation and, uh, and refractory intracranial pressure in these cases. Uh, so we'd escalate to more advanced therapies. Uh, the use of deep sedation may be required to control the respiratory drive and achieve uh, tidal volume targets. Uh, the ARDSNAP protocol uh, is a very well-established protocol. We've been using it for, uh, uh, for many, many years at this point. Uh, typically, you calculate, uh, you target a lower PEEP and higher FiO2. And uh, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, you can see here that for the most part, uh, people tend to accept a much lower uh, uh, PaO2 level. Now, in order to understand ARDS, it's very important to uh, know some, uh, like understand what the uh, PTF ratio. Uh, the PTF ratio is essentially the uh, arterial PaO2, which is the P from the ABG, uh, divided by the FiO2. So, how much FiO2, the fraction percentage or percentage of inspired oxygen that the patient is actually receiving. This is typically expressed as a decimal. So, 40%. If you say you hear uh, intensivists talk about like an FiO2 40%. As far as this formula is concerned, the FiO2 is essentially 0.4. So for, as an example, a P2F ratio, uh, for the most part, we typically uh, try to use a P2F ratio less than 300 as an indicator of acute respiratory failure. Um, so uh, for uh, acute lung injury criteria and ARDS criteria, um, uh, uh, 200 to 300 is considered uh, uh, mild ARDS or acute lung injury. Less than 200 is considered uh, 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 is considered a moderate ARDS, and less than 100 is considered severe ARDS. Now, how do you troubleshoot when uh, when uh, a, a patient on the vent is not really like uh, looking as well as you'd like them to? For so, for, as an example, if you cannot, for whatever reason, if you cannot oxygenate. Um, or the patient's, uh, uh, if you can't oxygenate, or the patient is hypoxic, and the PBTO2 is too low, um, the goal is uh, always to have a PAO2 more than 60. And to treat PAO2 is less than 60 by first thing is to adjust the PEEP. If the patient is very hypoxic, go straight to an FiO2 of 100%. Uh, the patient can always be titrated down later. Um, I've seen uh, people who, uh, when they see the PAO2 is in the 60s, they're like, all right, fine, let's just go from like 40 to 50 or 50 to 60 and gradually escalate. I will de-escalate relatively quickly, but when, I, when I'm treating uh, a PAO2 that is this low, for the most part, I will, um, I'll go immediately to an FiO2 of 100%. We can always de-escalate. Um, make PEEP adjustments, however, incrementally. Um, unlike the FiO2, the PEEP, you have to gradually go up. So start with a PEEP of five, gradually go up to a PEEP of eight, after that, 10, 12, and 14. And watch what happens in real time, over two to three minutes per change. The way I always tell my, uh, like, uh, my, 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 my residents and my fellows is that, for the most part, you treat like a patient in ARDS the exact same way you would treat a patient in status, um, uh, in the sense that as you're escalating your, your sedation to control the status, you're, you're watching the EEG to control it, uh, and you're not leaving the patient's bedside. Um, gradually increase the PA, uh, the, the PEEP, watch the ventilator and see what's happening. Uh, the patient will respond relatively quickly. Um, watch the oxygen saturation. If the resultant sats are more than 90%, uh, 
patience is profuse and you're okay. Otherwise, follow up with an ABG in 30 minutes. Um, All right, so what do you do if you cannot ventilate the patient? So the PCO2 is too high or the pH is too low. For the most part, your goal is a pH of uh, 7.25 or more than 7.25. If the pH is worse and respiratory acidosis occur, appears to be a major contributor, that is to say a PCO2 uh, more than 55 without an underlying COPD or similar comorbidities, increase the respiratory rate as long as it's adequate for the time of ex exhalation. So it's important as you increase the respiratory rate, remember that the, the machine is going to give the patient a breath every at, at the frequency that you set. You have to give the time, like the, the patient, some time to exhale. Otherwise, you run the, uh, the risks of uh, like uh, significant complications. Um, for the most part, uh, uh, I usually recommend as far as PEEP, if you get to a PEEP of 10 and the patient's not getting well, uh, call for help. Um, Likewise, here, if, the, if you're gradually going up on the respiratory rate, as long as there is, um, and you're maxed at, say, typically high 20s, low 30s, um, you can consider increasing the tidal volume in small increments. But before you do that, I would recommend calling for help. Um, follow the results of any interventions with an ABG in 30 minutes. Um, again, this is a simple uh, algorithm as far as maneuvers to improve oxygenation. So lung protective uh, ventilation strategy, increase the PEEP. Um, um, as you're increasing the PEEP, I would recommend calling for help. Um, before that, uh, we are typically, uh, like, a, like as a secondary stage, we are, um, uh, in the past, we would have paralyzed these patients. Nowadays, we're actually proning these patients. Um, uh, people who know me well know that I've been collecting silver linings as far as uh, uh, silver linings secondary to the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. What ends up, like what we found is uh, in the past, you can um, ask for prone, like for the patient to be prone for, for days before it actually gets done, if ever. Now uh, it's just become proning the standard of care and we are actually doing it very, very frequently. Um, recruitment maneuvers, uh, 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 high ventilation, oscillatory uh, ventilation, uh, use nitrous oxide and as a later stage ECMO. Um, according to the Seattle uh, uh, data, 60 to 80 percent mortality of COVID patients placed on mechanical ventilation. Um, I can tell you that's not been our experience. We're uh, uh, working on a couple of manuscripts as far as like uh, from a critical care standpoint, as far as like what the mortality is. Uh, we haven't really seen the, uh, seen mortality rates in that within that range. Um, that being said, many of our patients are still act like uh, are, are still intubated. We're still having uh, Although we've, uh, we feel like we may have plateaued at this stage, uh, unfortunately, we feel we probably plateaued at the peak. Um, so ARDS can be exacerbated by volume trauma, barotrauma, atelectotrauma, and biotrauma. So atelectotrauma is by uh, the repeated opening and closing of the alveoli, and um, you can, uh, like the, the alveoli can actually be significantly damaged by trauma, by hyperoxy and cytokine storms. The solution is essentially lung protective ventilation, which we talked about earlier. For the most part, you target a tidal volume between four and six. You can go up to eight, but uh, for the most part, you know that uh, if you're increasing your tidal volume, you probably should be calling for help at that point. Uh, proning uh, uh, with refractory hypoxemia, uh, hypoxemia, consider proning indications. Uh, 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 indications are PAO2, FIO2, or P2F ratio 150 or lower. For the most part, this is an extremely uh, taxing request of our staff, um, especially in a time of crisis. It re typically requires four to six people, usually also need neuromuscular blockade and deep sedation. Um, 16, for the most part, 16 hours prone, check an ABG two hours into this position, then four hours supine, check an ABG two hours later, lather, rinse, and repeat. Uh, proning, uh, prone position was first proposed in the 1970s as a method to improve uh, gas oxygenation and respiratory failure, and has been shown to improve the PA uh, to FiO2 ratio in mechanically ventilated patients with severe ARDS. 
Translating physiologic improvements into clinical benefits have proved challenging. So we don't necessarily have significant data, like, uh, like robust data that improves, uh, uh, that, that, that suggests that. However, until the, the Proceva trial that showed um, um, that there may be a, a mortality benefit in severe RDS, uh, uh, this has been very, very difficult. I could tell you in Europe, people do this much more routinely than we do in the United States. Um, uh, this is a patient that's uh, like, interestingly here, this is a patient who is um, on high flow nasal cannula. I don't know if you can see my marker, but this is a high flow nasal cannula who is um, in moderate ARDS, uh, believe it or not. And uh, uh, she's actually on her phone. And you can look over here. I don't know if it's projecting very well, but this patient's breathing at a rate of 54. Um, um, I actually borrowed this picture from uh, someone who posted this on social media. Um, I thought it was really, really interesting that like uh, at, at 54, and ever since then, we've actually been managing patients um, and delaying intubation for as long as possible, uh, and as long as it's safe for your patient. So let's begin with a question. So how does prone positioning improve oxygenation in patients with severe ARDS? So lots of theories, uh, whether it's redistribution of blood, increased chest compliance, or increased alveolar inflation. Now let's take them one by one. As far as redistribution of blood, um, uh, studies in animals and humans have shown that blood distribution in the lung does not necessarily change substantially from a supine to a prone position. You can see this is a, a perfusion scan that shows that there, there isn't significant difference as far as that is concerned. Um, as far as increasing ch chest wall compliance, the dorsal chest wall is actually less compliant than the ventral chest wall which leads to an overall net decrease in chest wall compliance when prone. Hence, since the ventral wall is impeded from expanding. So it's not that. The third theory is more uniform alveolar inflation. From an anatomical standpoint, just look at the, look at the, the actual shape of the lung within the chest wall. The, uh, the lung mass is greater in the dorsal regions than it is in the ventral regions. Um, and when supine, there's a greater distension of the ventral lung regions due to gravity as well as poor shape mismatching between the lung and chest wall. When prone, the forces of gravity and shape, mis uh, shape matching oppose each other, which leads to more homogeneous inflation of the pulmonary units from the sternum to the vertebra. Um, additionally, the, the, heart weighs no longer, uh, the heart rate no longer compresses the left lower lobe and abdominal pressure is lessened. Um, this leads to an overall recruitment in larger dorsal lung regions, which outweigh the degree of derecruitment in the smaller ventral lung regions, leading to an increased, uh, uh, increased lung compliance. So proning, this also explains why we don't typically see uh, an increase in peak plateau pressure during uh, uh, VC ventilation or decrease in tidal volume due to PC, uh, uh, pressure, support, uh, pressure control ventilation following proning. Prone positioning also helps uh, protect against uh, ventilation, ventilator uh, induced lung injury by just redistribu uh, redistributing the stress and, uh, uh, and strain more homogeneously through the lung. Um, based on uh, clinical data from Wuhan, uh, from Wuhan, COVID often relates, uh, leads to ICU admission, 15 to 20% of patients, ARDS in 20%, mechanical ventilation 3%, increasingly um, uh, uh, prone positioning combined with high flow nasal cannula, in our experience, has actually decreased the, the, uh, the number of patients actually requiring uh, mechanical ventilation. So uh, in summary, prone positioning leads to more homogeneous inflation of the lung. This improves oxygenation, reduces mortality in severe ARDS. High flow nasal cannula and prone positioning is a possible strategy to consider, in, um, uh, to, consider to avoid intubation, especially in COVID pandemic. But more studies are obviously going to be needed. As far as fluid management, um, it's uh, the WHO guidelines recommend uh, keeping your patient as dry as possible, unless they're in septic shock. But even then, I wouldn't fall and overload them. Preservative fluid management, Lasix for diuresis, consider intermittent spironolactone for potassium sparing effect. Uh, keep a uh, lookout for signs of tissue hypoxia or hyper hyperperfusion, low blood pressure, uh, increased lactate, and worsening kidney function. Uh, uh, fluid management, again, in septic shock, I typically will, uh, as opposed to the typical 30 cc's per kilogram, uh, 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 we will need, uh, we'll, we'll need, uh, uh, we'll typically pro, uh, primarily give 200 to 250 to 500 cc's of fluids. Um, uh, I would avoid too much fluids in these cases. 
Um, uh, as far as vasopressors are concerned, uh, my first line presser would be norepinephrine, second line would be uh, vasopressin, third line would be epinephrine. And there was a question whether there's a role for angiotensin receptor uh, agonist, uh, uh, geopresa. Um, I suggest calling for help as you get to 75% of max dose of pressors. Cardiac involvements, most patients have pulmonary involvement, but there's a subset of patients who have severe cardiac dysfunction. It's unclear whether this is an effect of the ACE inhibit, uh, uh, the, 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 the effect of the, uh, the virus on the ACE receptors, or, uh, and it's unclear whether ACE inhibitors or uh, angiotensin receptor blockers are helpful or harmful. Uh, there's a proposed mechanism for both. Um, fulminant malmyocarditis appears, uh, may appear after the resolution of a hypoxia. And I can tell you, in our experience, we've had uh, at least four to five patients who were actually discharged from the, hosp uh, from the uh, intensive care unit after being stable for a good number of days and ultimately bounced back because they became, uh, re uh, because of developing refractory uh, hypertension. Uh, so we're going to go through this really quickly. Uh, uh, there is also a, 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 like some, uh, uh, something that we've noticed is that patients with uh, kidney injury, uh, pa uh, patients with COVID-19 can actually develop acute kidney injury as an independent risk factor for in-house mortality. Um, uh, kidney replacement therapy as soon as possible. This is needless to say, uh, uh, resource heavy therapy and avoid, if using diuretics, uh, there is also a risk of hypo hypokalemia and contraction alkalosis. Uh, palliative care uh, discussions. Uh, we are typically having these discussions as we are intubating our patients. Um, and we are trying our best to have ongoing family discussions on a daily basis as uh, frequently as possible. Um, Uh, some tips, extra long tubing with IV pumps outside the room so the nurses can change parameters without going in. Make sure you uh, eat and use the bathroom as much as possible. Um, challenges for developing treatment for viral illnesses and antiviral drug must be able to target the specific uh, part of a virus life cycle um, and to kill the virus without killing the human cell that it occupies. So viruses are highly adaptive because they produce so rapidly and mutate with each generation causing re uh, developing resistance. Uh, steroids have been associated with increased risk of mortality in patients with influenza and decreased uh, viral clearance in patients with uh, MERS-CoV infection, although they were uh, widely used uh, 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 in the management of severe ARDS or severe SARS. There are no good, there's no good evidence for or, or benefit uh, for their use in this situation. Limited role of glucocorticoids, the WHO and CDC recommend glucocorticoids not be used in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia, unless there are other indications, example, exacerbation of COPD. Um, there's uncertainty regarding the use of uh, NSAIDs, uh, so we try to avoid them as much as possible. Um, uh, many of the medications that we use are, uh, uh, like a, there, there are so many different therapies that are coming on and we're, we're trialing them. Uh, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, uh, azithromycin, uh, uh, thalidomide, uh, to toxilizumab, uh, 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 hydrochloride, um, inhaled uh, nitrous oxide, colchicin, uh, lopinavir, retinavir, hyperimmune plasma, uh, ACE inhibitors, um, and, uh, uh, and there are uh, studies looking at chemoprophylaxis for healthcare, uh, exposed healthcare providers. Um, when I actually looked, went on uh, 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 clinicaltrials.gov, uh, there were uh, like the, the last time I checked, there were almost 500 actively running clinical trials uh, ongoing at this point. So I'm not going to go into all of them. I'm going to try to talk about the most commonly used uh, agents, remdesivir, for example. Um, uh, several ra uh, randomized trials are underway to evaluate the efficacy of rem remdesivir. Uh, it's a novel nucleotide analog. We're not going to go into the details into the mechanism of action. It's currently available by compassionate use in children and pregnant women. As of 324 through uh, Gilead through an investigational new drug application. Um, uh, since uh, since we started using it, there's been more and more uh, emerging data that uh, remdesivir is actually a very effective drug, um, and uh, uh, 
as expected, the Gilead stocks actually started to rise significantly. I think they increased by almost 200 or 300%. That being said, not long ago, there was a, a, a leak in the WHO uh, from one of the WHO governed uh, uh, clinical trial sites in China that showed that remdesivir is actually not like not as effective as we thought it was. So uh, my, my two cents is don't go uh, running to buy Gilead stocks just yet. Um, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, both uh, have been reported to inhibit SARS or COVID-2 in vitro. Um, appears to be potent antiviral activity uh, and the use of uh, uh, chloroquine is in, included in the treatment guidelines from, China's, uh, from China. Um, uh, there are a number of trials ongoing at this point. Uh, 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 what I could tell you in my, from, my, from my standpoint is we do use hydroxychloroquine at, like at like a, uh, West Russell Medical Center. That being said, uh, there is actually emerging data that it can actually be harmful um, is from uh, prolonging your QTC interval. Um, and the combination of isothromycin and hydroxychloroquine appear to have some beneficial effects, but there are methodologic concerns about the control groups for the studies and biologic basis for using isothromycin in setting is unclear. Um, despite limited clinical data and the relative safety and short-term use of hydroxychloroquine for the most part, it's five-day use, so is isothromycin. The lack of a known uh, effective interventions and the in vitro antiviral activity, some clinicians think it's reasonable, they feel it's reasonable to use hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients, especially if they're not eligible for other trials. Um, um, azithromycin, same applies to that. Uh, there is uh, very limited data, but for the most part, it's a, uh, it's a well-tolerated medication. Unfortunately, it can also prolong your QTC interval so I recommend uh, checking your like an EKG before you start your patients on any of these medications. Um, interleukin six uh, 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 is a, another medication that that was shown to be uh, efficacious. Uh, uh, lopinavir, ritinavir uh, is an antiviral, like a, a, an HIV, uh, like a, a protease inhibitor used for HIV infections. Um, uh, in some studies, it showed that there was no difference in clinical improvement or mortality at 28 days in the randomized controlled trial uh, with severe COVID-19. So although initially we were using it as a second stage, we have actually since then stopped. Um, convalescent plasma uh, is a potential option for treatment when there are sufficient numbers of people who have recovered and can donate higher titers of neutralizing immunoglobulin uh, containing plasma. In general, passive immunity is better at the onset of the disease or as prophylaxis. So for the most part, if you're going to give uh, uh, convalescent plasma, it should be given within the first three days. Um, uh, chemoprophylaxis, this is a new trial, uh, a trial that is uh, uh, currently enrolling patients is a phase three trial uh, uh, looking at four. Uh, uh, so basically, if you look at the data, 4% of all healthcare workers uh, dealing directly with COVID-19 uh, inflicted patients uh, were affected. Since then, the number has actually risen to approximately 15%. So it's hard to know which one actually, uh, well, like what numbers to believe. Um, for the most part, what I would say is uh, uh, this is a, it's a, it's a novel uh, 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 cause looking at medications that would essentially provide prophylaxis to healthcare workers. The name of the study is COVID Axis. There are two arms to the study, one comparing hydroxychloroquine versus placebo, and the other one looking at lopinavir, ritinavir versus placebo. Um, uh, uh, that trial is still ongoing. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Jawad Kermani, who is um, also running a trial out of uh, uh, Hackensack uh, Meridian Health System, uh, looking at hydroxychloroquine for uh, chemo uh, prevention for COVID-19 primarily for uh, high-risk uh, healthcare workers. Um, at Westchester, we have a three-tiered approach. Uh, uh, since, my, uh, since preparing the slide, it's actually become a two-tiered approach. Uh, patients with mild disease uh, will receive hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, provided their QTC interval is not too high, not, not, not prolonged, more, not, uh, less than 500. Patients with moderate disease uh, uh, will start azithromycin, hydroxychloric, uh, and azithromycin. Add lopinavir, ropinavir. However, since the new trials came out showing that uh, uh, there is a limited or restricted benefit to this, we have actually uh, uh, stopped that. What we've started doing here is um, if there is progression of disease on the first line therapy, 
uh, uh, beyond 30, 72 hours, we continue hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And uh, on a trial basis, on a, like enrollment in a trial looking at either remdesivir or uh, looking at sarilumab or case uh, Kesvara, which is also an interleukin-6. Uh, this is primarily in if I, uh, the IL-6 levels are uh, in patients are not uh, are high and they're not candidates for remdesivir. Um, Sometimes when we're in practice, like uh, when I'm in the unit and uh, we see a patient get better and, uh, and after a while they, they, they're, they're, they continue to improve, I feel like this guy sometimes. I don't know if the video is projecting well. Um, I imagine myself like this guy. Um, I've since cut my hair and gained significantly more weight since the COVID-19. So this guy doesn't necessarily represent me now. Um, but I feel like this is me stopping the train. And this is me sending my patients out. I feel like although despite our best efforts, we're not necessarily, we, we don't necessarily know exactly what we're dealing with. For every trial that showed hydroxychloroquine worked, there was another trial that came out and showed sure it didn't. For every trial that showed um, um, uh, 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 for remdesivir, for example, now we have like some data that suggests that it may not necessarily be the, uh, the best medication for these patients. Um, I, like in the, earlier in, the, in my talk, I, I said that I've, I've been collecting silver linings uh, uh, as far as this pandemic, just to keep myself sane. Um, what we've noticed is there's been an unprecedented improvement in quality improvement. It's definitely demonstrated holes in our uh, systems of care uh, for the most part and uh, how unprepared we are. And I, I believe it's going to uh, help us uh, better improve how we're going to deal with this in the future. There's some studies that demonstrated, especially from NASA, that uh, say that there is reduced pollution and 25% less greenhouse emissions. Not sure how sustainable this is once factories are up and running. I think we're probably going to go, uh, uh, there, there are going to be other reports saying that we're 25% up. Um, successful wide implementation, uh, implementation and a jumpstart to the telemedicine care era, as uh, my colleagues earlier spoke. I think this is like what COVID-19 did as far as like, uh, 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 for, uh, for telemedicine is incredible. Uh, 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 we joke saying that uh, uh, this has been the best marketing uh, uh, investment that, that anybody could have done is to hire COVID-19 to, to do what it did in order for telemedicine to, to get jump started like this. And importantly, uh, there has been an incredible improvement in social connection and sense of family, all by virtual. Um, uh, I personally have been able to like all my days off when I'm not in the ICU and I'm not managing my, uh, like, uh, and not on call for endovascular. Um, I've, I feel like I've been able to spend more time with my family than I was before. Um, I, we have a few more minutes. I wanted to share a poem that my daughter actually wrote. Um, uh, ironically that like, uh, like, uh, uh she, she's 11 years old, but she, uh, and she's in sixth grade. And uh, she wrote a poem that's called uh, Stronger the COVID-19. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel like I have to be very careful what I say all over the phone when, when she's around. Um, the last paragraph is, is, is about me. Actually, this goes on for like three pages. I saved you guys the, 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 the trouble of going through it, the whole thing. Uh, but she talks about who I talk, like, uh, like about, um, she talks about uh, Governor Cuomo and about patients dying due to a vi this virus made of a gene and who gets the ventilator and who gets the ICU bed. And I, I was really shocked when I read this because I didn't realize that she was actually paying attention to, to these decisions that we're making. Um, if you want to hear more about uh, COVID-19, we, uh, we, I, I, like I conduct the, the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. I recommend that you all uh, please uh, listen to this, subscribe and like us. Um, there's an episode we released specifically on COVID-19. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, 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 Rashira and Jay, who spearheaded the Neuro Heroes, who have been uh, uh, sending meals to neuro ICUs around the country. Uh, uh, on behalf of my ICU and neurocritical care units around the, um, around the United States, thank you very much.
uh, uh, Jay and Rishira. Um, and thank you very much, SVIN, for uh, endorsing this movement because uh, I can tell you that other societies turned this movement down. So I'm very, very proud of what SVIN has done. Uh, uh, life is short. Uh, we are uh, desperate cases need desperate measures. Make no mistake, we are still very much in, in a desperate crisis mode. And it's very important for us to stick together and try to do our best to, uh, 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 to take care of one another. Uh, this is me on social media. Uh, follow me if you have a chance. And uh, yeah, ready to take any questions. All right, let me uh, take a quick look here. Um, I saw an earlier question about uh, uh, who we, uh, we anticoagulate. Uh, I don't know if there was a question on this or a question that came up on this. Yeah. Um, for the most part, we're not anticoagulating every patient. Um, I'm sorry, Rhonda, I, uh, you, were, you were muted, so I just uh, decided to take that first question. Um, uh, we don't anticoagulate every single patient uh, if they don't have any contraindications. They're hyperinflammatory. I will, uh, uh, for the most part, we will uh, consider uh, anticoagulation. Um, for the most part, my, our cutups have been a D-dimer more than 1,000, a ferritin level more than 500, uh, a CRP more than 100. Um, so they're uh, hyperinflammatory, which in my mind translates to hypercoagulable, in which case I am at anticoagulating these patients. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. All what about vent modes? What vent modes are you using specifically for these patients? So um, it depends. For the most part, we've been using uh, uh, ACVC, uh, ACVC plus. I've been using bilevel. I've been using SIMV. Um, every patient is a little bit different. I think the the uh, more important than the, the the vent mode is to follow the arts and the protocol. mute myself so sorry it's all right i could hear you tracheostomy uh at all in these patients or are you keeping them intubated when you have to intubate them until they're um kind of safely out of that zone that's a great question uh so for the most part um um for the most part what we've done is essentially uh what we've done is We've kept them intubated for as long as possible. The hospital came up with a policy to uh, uh, avoid tracheostomies, especially when they're still hyperactive. Uh, this is an aerosol generating procedure. Um, everybody gets exposed. It puts everybody at risk. So we try, we're trying to delay it as much as possible. Now that we're, uh, we're getting more and more patients who've been intubated for like almost two weeks or up to three weeks, we've actually been slowly starting to trach patients. So um, I think we started tracking patients last week uh, while taking significant precautions. Uh, we uh, were able to obtain uh, certain filters, but there's no way of minimize, uh, like there, there are ways to minimize the amount of aerosolization, but uh, it's never perfect. Right. What about the prone positioning? You know, in ARDS, we keep them prone for hours and, and then we, we maybe turn them maybe twice. Are you turning them more often? Or are you leaving them in terms of an ARDS protocol for proning? Uh, so we're doing ARDS protocol for proning for the most part. Um, I, I would say uh, uh, we've typically been doing, uh, uh, like I said, it's, a, it's, it's definitely, it definitely is a very resource heavy intervention. Mm -hmm. For the most part, we, uh, uh, we've been proning them for a good uh, 16 hours during the day. Uh, we check an ABG two hours into this position and, and then four hours supine and then check an ABG two hours later. Um, uh, we're trying to space this out, unlike what we did for like a typical ARDSnet protocol, primarily because, uh, because like we're trying to minimize that our nurses going into the rooms as much as possible. And this is not only the nurse, this is the nurse and uh, like two nurses and, and three other assistants. We try to minimize this, but in order to keep it safe, you need at least four to six people in the room. And you talked about transfusing uh, uh, plasma a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about your indications for doing that? And you may have gone over that a little bit, but could you emphasize the indications that would make you choose to go that route? 
Yeah, so we just became a site for uh, for that. We have not started to do uh, uh, convalescent plasma yet, so I can't really uh, speak uh, like with confidence to that answer. To answer that. Okay. Um, what about uh, have you seen patients who are already on uh, Plaquenil or for uh, RA or other conditions, and do they respond differently to COVID or? Using you know. You know, I think that that video demonstrates exactly how I feel. Sometimes I feel it helps. Sometimes I feel it doesn't help. Uh, whether I'm the guy trying to stop the train or I'm the guy pushing the train, I, I really never know. Yeah. Can you look at a patient um, and say this patient's going to do well? Uh, this patient will, uh, will will do well, and we're going to be okay. And they're the high, they're happy hypoxemics, basically. Um, can you look at a patient like that? And if you can't, what factors affect those good outcomes? Um, for those patients that you've seen? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, um, uh, I, wish I, could, I wish I had the power to look at a patient and tell who's going to do well. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind I would win the Nobel Prize if I were able to do that. Um, uh, uh, I think patients who are, so we trend our inflammatory markers um, on a daily basis. So every day, every single patient will get D-dimer, CPK, C CRP, LDH, uh, ferritin levels, um, uh, troponins, um, ALT and AST, as far as like BMP and, like, uh, and, um, and ABGs. And if by, for the most part, what I've noticed is if by day 12, these patients are not intubated and they're doing, they're, and they're, they're, they're still on hyponasal cannula, um, I feel for the most part, I feel like I've gotten them, sorry, by, by day 14, if they're, they're still okay, I feel like I may have gotten them uh, uh, like on the set, like a, they're, they're, they're probably going to be okay. That being said, uh, for uh, I know many of my colleagues are already taking care of COVID, COVID patients, and I can't just begin to describe how demoralizing it is after you've sent the patient out of the ICU and they bounce right back with like a like a like a refractory shock now, and and you're trying your best to, to resuscitate this patient. Um, fortunately, you develop these relationships. Uh, even though you, you're not in the room as frequently, but like you're, you're really vouching for these patients to do well. Mm -hmm. um, are you admitting patients to the floor that have sort of milder symptoms and things like that? And how are you treating those patients on the floor versus how you're treating them in the ICU on ventilation and things like that? Yeah, no. Uh, so well, we definitely have COVID patients on the floor. Um, at this point, we are up to, um, so we started out with, uh, like naively, I would say we started out with, uh, uh, with the uh, with, with the assumption that our MICU was going to be our COVID unit, and it like just to be proactive, we actually designated another area to be a COVID unit. Um, so we had approximately forty bed like a COVID ICU prepared. Little did we know that we were going to go from that to essentially six COVID units. Um, yeah. Um, uh, full of like really, really sick patients. Um, at, at one point we had up to, uh, 300 patients in the intensive care unit around the hospital. So essentially a third of the hospital was, was COVID patients. Um, uh, that being said, when you're dealing with patients who are that sick, you have to keep patients in a step down level of care. So we never really had patients on the floor per se. They were all on pulse ox and on telemetry. Um, and, and again, everybody received the, the same protocol as far as like daily management, uh, daily monitoring of their, uh, 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 monitoring of their, uh, uh, inflammatory markers, their, uh, 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 like, uh the BMP and all the, like all the other markers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, if we felt like a patient was starting to look bad, then these patients were escalated and brought to the intensive care unit as soon as possible. Um, how much nitrous oxide have you used, if any? So that's a good question. At this point, it's not really recommended for uh, uh, it's not recommended for routine use. Um, a trial of nitrous oxide is reasonable for refractory hypoxemia, as abnormal hypoxic vasoconstriction may play uh, may play a significant role in the patient's deteriorating. Um, it you need one needs to consider the risk of uh, aerosol generation and uh, circuit disconnection and their implications for viral transmission if used because uh, this is not something that you do once and you're done. This is something that you'll need to constantly do. And 
anytime, like we're trying to prevent the interruption of the system as much as possible. What about, uh, have you ever used, there's a question, have you ever used um, ivermectin? Um, I'm sorry, what? Have you ever used ivermectin? I have not, no. Okay, okay. And um, and one, one other question I had for you was, in your experience with Doctors Without Borders, how does that, those kind of crises and, and dealing with a stressful situation, really dealing with dire circumstances, help you deal with this circumstance? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really tough question. Uh, uh, so working with Doctors Without Borders was, um, needless to say, was an incredible experience. It was extremely humbling. Um, I would say this experience was similarly humbling because not infrequently, almost on a daily basis, you're dealing with uh, patients where you don't, you you truly don't know whether you're not you're helping them or not. Um, with Doctors Without Borders, most of my work was emergency medicine in in war zones. Um, it was more trauma medicine than this. Uh, but the fact that the sense of helplessness occasionally, uh, it, like that, I currently feel sometimes is uh, definitely gives me flashbacks of the day, days with Doctors Without Borders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate so much you being with us and I appreciate all the colleagues that we've had uh, to join us for your presentation. Thank you so much for, um, for explaining critical care um, to us during this crisis because it is an important part of their recovery and the support that we have. So I thank you very much. Well, thank uh, you for having me.